Periclus and Athens by A. R. Byrne. The golden age of Greece seen through the life of her leading statesman. Fourteen is the last chapter, isn't it? Yep, it is. The Plague. The Peloponnesians had not been long in Attica. When the plague was reported from Piraeus, the rumor spread that Peloponnesian agents had poisoned the cisterns, but then the sickness spread to the upper city as well, where there was running water. Better informed people connected it with the pestilence that starting in Ethiopia, beyond Egypt, had already ravaged much of the Persian Empire. It was terribly hot in the overcrowded city. The seasonal north winds failed almost completely that year, and the huts of the refugees stank to heaven. But in spite of a mounting death rate, preparations for the summer sea raid went on. You know, it's, it's like this time of year, there's a perpetual mythology of, oh, and the berry and, and grape harvest, so it's time for war and hate. And it's like, what, you have to bring it out on an annual basis, just for principle? Archidamos, having felt the defense in the previous summer and made sure that Pericles would not fight this year, led down his main army to devastate the plain of Athens. Hence, leaving ruin behind, they moved on eastwards, past Hametos, and raided da right down the peninsula into the silver mining district. While they were there, at their furthest point from home, Pericles himself set sail with a hundred Athenian triremes, fifty from Lesbos and Chaos, four thousand Athenian armored infantry, and three hundred cavalry in the new horse transports, and struck straight across the gulf to attack the considerable city of Epidauros. Epidauros, as a Spartan ally, must have sent a contingent to Attica, and was thinly garrisoned. Pericles' sudden assault delivered in great strength, very nearly captured it, but not quite. Surprise being thus lost, it was useless to settle down to a siege. A blockade would soon be interrupted by the return of the main Peloponnesian army. So after devastating the country, the expedition set sail again, rounded the peninsula of Argolis, harrying the coast of Trizen and Hermione, crossed the Argolic Gulf to sack Thracia on the coast of Laconia, and so returned home. This episode shows that Pericles' advice to the assembly not to try to extend the empire during the war did not mean that Athens was not to hit back hard against the Peloponnese, so long only as she did not endanger her main forces. It referred rather to purely divergent operations in the distant regions like Sicily. The strategic effects of the capture of Epidauros would have been far-reaching. The walled city once taken and its people perhaps ejected would not have been hard to hold. And in the, ter and in the territory marched with that of neutral and friendly Argos, Troizen, and Hermione would have been isolated and probably won over. Athens would have had a f firmer footing in the Peloponnese than Peloponnese in the, uh, than before in 446 BCE, and the position of Corinth would have been serious. Now, in the Quran, Surah 9, one of the things that comes up is fighting those adjacent to you. And I guess this kind of fits into it. But, you know, those who are starting war with you. Um, 
if they're still off, it's like in the future, maybe something. Um, not kind of leave those people alone for now. But so this is a different way of looking at the same principle here. Pericles returned to find the plague raging at Athens with an alarming death roll. The Spartans had gone, seared away, some said, by the news brought by runaway slaves and by the smoke which they could see rising from many funeral pyres. But they had stayed in the country for forty days. The longest, as it proved, of all their invasions, as the four thousand men of the expeditionary force were now free, it was decided to send them the Potidea under Hagnon and Cleopompas to try by a full dress assault with battering rams to the end uh, to end the long and expensive blockade. The result, however, was disastrous. They carried the plague with them and communicated it to the troops already there. And in camp conditions, the death rate was even higher than in Athens. After six weeks, Hagnon called off the campaign and leading a blockading force, as before, returned to Athens, having lost by sickness alone 1,050 men. And the great plague of Athens seems to have been that its primary and generally deadly manifestations. Pneumonic, the form which the Black Death assumed in France, after appearing in the bubonic form in Italy, the Cadidas, who himself suffered from it, describes it with the stern accuracy of a scientific report, conscientiously avoiding the loose speculation as to the causes and origins in which both doctors and untrained people, as he dryly remarks, were indulging all around him. Individuals in perfect health would be seized suddenly with violent headaches, the eyes were bloodshot, the tongue and gullet red, the breath foul and noisome. Then came sneezing, hoarseness, and shortly thereafterwards, violent coughing, and a retching of every kind of bile known to medical science. Accompanied by great distress, the body was not hot to the touch, nor pale, but flushed and livid, breaking out in a rash of small ulcers and pustulus. But internally, there was such burning fever that the patient could not bear the covering of even the thinnest clothes or sheets or anything else than to be absolutely naked. And the great wish was to throw oneself into cold water. Many, being untended, did so into the wells, consumed as they were with thirst, but it made no difference however much one drank. And the distress of the insomnia was upon one all this time. Death came usually either about the seventh to the ninth day from the fever, or else latter from the ulceration of the stomach, diarrhea, and general exhaustion. Of those who recovered, some did so relatively quickly after the fever and cough had gone, some slowly or not completely at all, for the plague went through the whole body, from the head downwards, and if one survived the main attack, it fastened on the extremities. People survived with crippled hands or feet, are impotent, are blind, or with total loss of memory, even carry on eating birds and beasts, though there were many corpses lying unburied, never went near them, or if they ate of them, they died. In fact, there was a conspicuous absence of such birds in dogs, the result could naturally be better studied. The infectiousness of the disease was appalling. Many doctors died. People caught it from those who were trying to nurse. Until, in the end, people became afraid to go near the sick at all. Some houses were left empty, the whole family having died for lack of attention. Alternatively, those who did attend to the sick died off, especially, says Bacadidas, Grimly, the most virtuous, for their sense of honor made them uninspiring, 
made them unsparing of themselves and visiting friends whose own kin had given up at last. Overborne by the greatness of the disaster, those who had recovered, however, took pity on the sick and dying because they knew the disease already and because they themselves were in safety, for the plague never attacked the same person twice, at least not fatally. Such people were the object of congratulations, and, and they themselves felt a sort of superstitious confidence that no disease was ever going to kill them after that. And two aspects that are important in the, spirit, in the religious way of looking at the whole plague issue is don't go to the house of worship if you think you're contagious. Knock it off. I'm, I'm, you know, every, every year have to bring up some sort of narration or something. One person goes or, <coughs> you know, um, and it's not just, you know, it's, it's in a way that, it's, uh, that they're, they're obviously sick. It's not just, you know, they're dry from the car or something. Um, and then next thing you know, uh, a week later, People are either gone or half the people there are sick, and it's like, oh, why did they do that? What? You know, I told you not to come when you're sick. Um, and other faiths have that too. You kind of stay place when there's a plague. You don't go from city to city. Hey, man, there's a plague over there. Oh, yeah, I heard about the plague too. You know, <laughs> like, this evidently was how the Kadidas. Austere, conscientious, and a man of wide human sympathies gained his detailed knowledge of the endless variations of the disease. The plague lasted all that summer and the next, and after a pause in 428, flared up again finally in 427. 300 knights, 4,400 4, of the middle class armored spearmen registered on the war office lists died in all, of the poor probably in even higher proportion. But Cadides, as he went about his self-imposed duties, noted the growing signs of social disintegration. The refugees in their stifling shacks died off, like Hagdon's men in camps, even faster than those who had proper houses. The dead and dying lay on top of each other, are sprawled in the streets and round all the springs, and there were corpses in the temples where there had been camping. What would before the war had been a shocking sacrilege, had ceased to attract attention. People disposed of their dead any how one could, often regardless of decency, sometimes putting a corpse upon someone else's pyre and setting a light to it, or throwing a second body on top of one that was already burning and running away. Demoralization took the form of a general outbreak of hedonism. I think this is bound to be a different sort of hedonism because hedonism is looking at the cost and rewards of the situation. It's not. Pleasure seeking became more fevered, vice more unblushing. Decadence would be the right word. The desire for quick profits keener. The will to take trouble for an ideal almost non-existent, while religion and law alike lost their power to restrain. Religion because men saw the pious and the irreligious perishing alike, and law because they felt that they would probably not live long enough to be brought to book for their misdeeds, as the worst doom hung over their heads of all, and before it fell, it was, res it was reasonable to get some pleasure out of life. Well, it is reasonable to get some pleasure out of life, but that doesn't mean that you abandon discipline, um, abandon what's right. Well, at least according to one's own terms. Um, the picture is extraordinarily like that in... What? Chachio? Bachachio? Is it... Is it Boccaccio? How do you say it? B-O-C-C-A-C-C-I-O? A Florentine society under the shadow of Black Death. 
In circumstances, it was hardly surprising that the people turned upon Pericles as the author of their misfortunes. They even, perhaps, during his absence with the fleet, made overtures for peace. But the Spartans stood out for terms. But the ambassadors had no power to accept. They returned to Athens, and Pericles, finding himself the object of the people's disparaging rage, demanded an assembly to defend himself and attack those who sued for peace at such a moment. I am not surprised at your anger. The Cadidus reports him, for I know its cause. That is why I have called this meeting, to remind you of certain facts and to find fault with you for what is illogical in your anger with me and your attitude of defeatism. They must, he goes on, set the state's well-being above their individual troubles, for if the state fares well, it can look after its less fortunate citizens. But if his country falls, no individual's prosperity can survive. Whether a spiritual society or a country, it's important for us to go towards the efforts that will uh, leave things surviving with or without our lives or thriving. Because even when it looks like, oh, things are going to be lost, we're not going to succeed in this manner, some of those times it will get through if the sincere effort is made. He demands, in effect, a vote of confidence as an advisor of well-trained judgment, patriotism, and indifference to money. In blaming him, he points out, they blame themselves for taking his advice and voting for war. If there had been any choice, it was lunacy to go to war. But if the only alternative was for the city to be at the mercy of its neighbors, then the man who shirks the risk should be blamed, not he who faces it. I am the same man still, and have not shifted my position. It is you who change, since you were convinced by my reasoning when unhurt, and regret it when things go badly. They must not let their judgment be warped by the present unexpected and unpredictable disaster. He had explained at other times the reasons for confidence in final victory, but here he goes on is a new point, which I do not think you have realized, and which I myself have not mentioned in previous speeches. Well, if it's for defense, if it's, if it's really for defense, not suspicions of others, it's, if it's really to defend the country, you must certainly blame those who do not uh, fight in self-defense that have the means physically, uh, you know, in their uh, terms of their physical body and otherwise. This new point was the absolutely unlimited potential potentialities of Athens, unrivaled sea power. The whole sea was theirs, not only so far as their ships now plied, but as much farther as they chose. There was, in fact, a very good reason why Pericles had never exploited it before. It was a very dangerous theme for a people whose great fault was overconfidence. I should not mention it now. Went on Pericles, frankly. So daring it sounds, were it not for the excessive depression in which I see you. They must not, then, be too distressed at the devastation of the land, they should think of their lands as an added amenity, not the basis of their wealth. Make up your minds that if we hold fast our freedom, our freedom of action, we should say, we shall easily regain all this. But people who are dependent on others lose even the wealth they have. Then comes an appeal to pride not to be weaker than their fathers, who ganged and held the empire by their labors. Pride in the empire itself. Well, the, um, the contest of being who you are, but uh, doesn't have to go to pride to be strong. You must support the city's reputation, which depends on this empire of which you were all proud, 
either do not shirk the labor or do not expect the glory. Realize, too, that you are fighting, not only for one thing, freedom or subjugation, but also to avert loss of your empire, the revenge of those who hate you for having it, had it, and you cannot lay it down. In case anyone who is now feeling frightened tries to make a virtue of peaceableness, for this empire of yours is now a, de a despotism, which it may have been wrong to acquire, but which it is now dangerous to let go. Gentry like these, the peace party, if people listen to them, are the quickest to ruin a city. Peacefulness cannot survive unless it is wedded to vigor and action. Nor is it any virtue for an imperial city, but for subjects, a slave's virtue to save his skin. Do not be led astray by people like these, and do not be angry with me. You who took with me the decision to fight, because the enemy have come and done exactly what they might be expected to do if you refused to submit. Nor yet, because of the present epidemic, the one factor in the present situation that was not anticipated, that I know is one reason for the feeling against me, which is unfair unless you are going to credit me with any good luck that you may meet with. You must bear the acts of God with resignation, and the state's enemies with courage. This was the way of Athens in the past. Do not let do not let it end with you. Remember that her name stands highest among all mankind because of her steadfastness in adversity and the blood and sweat that she has spent in wars and that hers was the strongest power that has ever been seen, a power whose memory will remain forever, even if we do now give in. It is in the nature of things to decay, the memory that we have ruled over more Greeks than any other Greek state, that we held our own in greater wars against them, whether severally or altogether, and that ours was the greatest and best found city of the world. Now, just because there's been mistakes in nationalism in the past, that doesn't mean that we have to, you know, that we can't look back on the issue and say, yeah, let's, let's, uh, let's do better this time. Or just because it was wrong, what was done, let's do what's right now. These are things which the pacifist may condemn, but the man of action will admire them, and those who have no such power will envy. Unpopularity at the time has been the lot of every ruling power, and to accept it for a great end is the soundest attitude. The hatred does not last long, but the splendors of the hour and the glory that follows after are remembered forever. Look then to your fair fame in the future and to your honor now. Send no more heralds to Sparta and let no one see you overwhelmed by your present troubles. But consider those who meet trouble with the stoutest heart and the strongest hands are both the best citizens and the best individuals. Pericles won his point, insofar as no more overtures were made to Sparta, both humanly and illogically. The bitterness against him remained. The enemies, his enemies seized their opportunity not long afterwards. For the first time in 15 years, Pericles lost the position of general, perhaps suspended by the refusal of the vote of confidence, which, at least in the next century, had to be passed in each Pratani. Pratana? Pratana. Suspension implied the immediate scrutiny of the general's accounts. With or without formal impeachment, it appears that Pericles's accounts were in confusion, hardly surprising in such a year, so that the council inevitably had to find a true bill and send the case before the law courts. Dracontidas, probably with hostile intent, carried a proposal that Pericles' account books should be deposited with the Pratenais. 
the trial should take place on the holy ground of the Acropolis, and that the jury should take their voting ballots from the altar itself. But Hagnon, on his return from Thraka in July, got this theatrical procedure amended. Pericles was tried before an ordinary jury of 1,501, three panels of 500, group for this important case. He was found at fault to the extent of five talents, a modest sum, a modest sum in the circumstances, and fined probably 15. Pericles now had an opportunity to rest, but he got little joy of it. The plague was at its height. Almost every day brought news of death of some friend or associate. Pericles' sister died. So did Xanthipas. Or is it San de Pou? Is that, I, I don't, maybe Santapu is a different, uh, Santipas, still unreconciled to his father after their bitter quarrel. Then very shortly afterwards, Paralos, his only other legitimate son, when he followed the funeral of the young man, and the time came for him to lay a wreath upon the corpse, it was observed for a second time in his career that Pericles wept. While he remained at home in mourning, it was represented to him if he would stand again for the generalship, he would certainly be elected. The people had got over their resentment. Many, probably, were ashamed of themselves, and his old colleagues were missing him at councils of war. Pericles had done with ambitions, but his friends, among others, Alcibiades, now a handsome, gallant, ambitious young soldier, urged him, saying the city had need of him. He stood and was elected as a token of favor, and that his house may not be left without heirs. The assembly also legitimized and made an Athenian, a step now required, such an act of parliament, Pericles' namesake, his natural son by Aspasia. It was one of the ironies of his career that Pericles, the author of the law in 451, should have to ask such a favor. The younger Pericles lived to be a general, and the financial records show a prominent one in the latter years of the, Pelopon the Peloponnesian War, before falling a victim in one of the last tragedies of that long-drawn struggle. In 429, Pericles was elected general for the last time, but he leaves no further mark in the pages of Thucydides. He was a sick man, one of those perhaps who survived an attack of the plague but never fully recovered. His absence was already affecting operations of war. For example, when reinforcements were being sent to Formion, who, with only 20 ships, was on guard at Naupactos. The ambitious assignment of blocking the Corinthian Gulf, the enemy were mustering an overwhelming strength to destroy him. But the assembly, no military expert, it seems, now strong enough to deter it, gave the reinforcements a mission to accomplish in Crete on the way. The result, which was which that the squadron failed in Crete, and after being held there by the north winds, arrived too late to now Pactos. That Formion survived the attack was merely due to the superb skill and morale of himself and his sailors. But Pericles lay bedridden. Aspasia can one blame her, was wondering who would protect her if he died. She picked on the rising radical general, Lucicles, but he was killed in action in winter 428 to 427. However, her son Pericles was growing up by 424. To a friend who visited him, the old, sick, uh, the old man showed something hanging by a string round his neck, a charm said Pericles. The woman hung it on me. Eh, I must be in a poor way when I put up with that sort of superstition. Now, something symbolic, you know, um, 
you know, uh, something symbolic. If you think that it has power, it's, it's protecting you. That's one thing. If you're using it, if it has meaning to you, that can be a different thing. So charms and amulets, not for that sort of thing. As the hot weather passed into the soft Greek autumn, and the plague at length showed the signs of abating, it became clear that he was dying. The room was full of generals, ex-generals, notabilities, and the survivors of his old friends come to bid him farewell. We have no list of their names, but can make a good guess at many. Tried colleagues, uh, tried colleagues like Hagnon and Nikias, who was, is, who was to succeed him, so far as mediocrity can succeed genius. The fighting generals like Lamachos and Formion, back victorious from the west, to die soon after, probably of the plague. Yeah. Um, that could be this, probably Ponikos, son of old Callias, and husband of Pericles' ex-wife, of the younger men Alkia Biades, and Hippocrates, Pericles' brother's son, who was attempting, who was to attempt the reconquest of boy Atia, and to meet his death there. The boy Pericles, shy and unsure of his position, and old Sophocles, who was to live and work in his fullest possession, in, in fullest possession of his faculties for another 23 years. Okay, I'm gonna stop there and Okay, so one more to finish this chapter, and then, you know, talk about the, uh, the, the lineage, or the, uh, that sort of thing. Um, is it the lineage? What is it called? The aristocracy, yeah, the aristocracy. But, coming to see someone off who's dying of the plague, and for people to die afterwards, probably of the same plague, is no big surprise. It's no sign of piety or impiety. It's just how things work.